First, I want to welcome each and every one of you to my district and that of Assemblymember Jimmy Gomez. I the 24th Senatorial District and the 51st Assembly District. I'm very happy to have all of you here on this very historic occasion. This is a very proud day for the state of California, for the nation, and the entire world. Today we take the next, we take the next step in our global environmental leadership, charting the course for a more prosperous, sustainable, and equitable future. Not only are we doubling down on building a new clean energy economy, we're also putting into law the principles of economic fairness and environmental justice within all of our climate goals. And I'm extremely grateful to our governor, Jerry Brown. Let's give it up for Governor Jerry Brown. To our great senator who started this all with AB 32 back in 2006, Senator Fran Powley. <laughs> to my partner who helped get this across the finish line, the Assembly, Assembly Speaker Anthony Rendon. And to Eduardo Garcia for his exemplary leadership in the assembly to help Speaker Rendon drive us across the finish line. I am so proud of this coalition that's on this stage here today. And I'm extremely proud of the advocates and activists who are in this audience here today who helped us come to fruition. Because of you, working collectively together, the legislative leadership and Governor Jerry Brown we're again doing something that's historic, that's going to impact the lives of so many children, not just in California, but trust me, throughout the nation and throughout the world. We've once again raised the bar for the nation and the world to follow. Now it's time to use all of the tools available to us to ensure that we meet our ambitious goals. That includes investing our cap and trade dollars now so they can make a difference. A difference in the lives of those most impacted by pollution, poverty, and unemployment. We can build more parks. We can build more parks just like this one. The first one built in downtown Los Angeles area in more than 100 years. California's leadership. <laughs> California's leadership in climate policy is about improving our quality of life. We've chosen not to settle for the most convenient path but to test the limits of our intellect and resolve. Today, we affirm our commitment for the future, and then in itself is a cause for celebration. Want to say a few words just in Spanish? Quiero decir muchas gracias a todos los grupos comunitarios hoy día presentes. Aquellas personas que alzaron sus voces en favor de SB32 y la AB197. Quiero reconocer también a nuestro gobernador Jerry Brown, nuestro presidente de la Asamblea, Anthony Rendon, a nuestros campeones, Senator Fran Pavley y Anthony Rendon, y todos nuestros colegas aquí presentes en el Senado, igual en la Asamblea, que nos ayudan a empujar esta propuesta, que es histórica, no solamente en el Estado de California, sino a nivel nacional e internacional. And to all the activists, todos los activistas presentes hoy día, gracias, gracias a ustedes, porque con ustedes hicimos el trabajo, el trabajo duro, para hacer todo lo posible para que nuestros hijos respiran en sus pulmones día tras día aire limpio y aire puro. Con eso, with that, it's with great pleasure that I bring my partner, my colleague, who helped bring this across the finish line in the assembly, that is Speaker Anthony Rendon. Thank you, Mr. Pro Tem. Good afternoon. SB 32 extends California's greenhouse gas reduction goals, while AB 197 changes how we make sure those goals are reached. The Assembly, where AB 32 was passed 10 years ago, we will be vigilant and vigorous in making sure California's climate change goals are met, and that they are met as we intended. Most Assembly members who voted for these bills will be in office for another 8 to 10 years. We are going to approach, uh, we're going to approach very thoughtfully and very thoroughly the new oversight abilities these bills grant us. 
I am also going to ensure that the Speaker's appointments to the Air Resources Board is committed to bringing benefits of greenhouse gas reductions to every community in California. The successful effort behind these two bills is the latest sign of a growing consensus that protecting the environment and improving public health are inextricably linked and that maintaining that link is key to advancing future environmental actions. I want to thank my colleagues who are here today and my colleagues throughout the assembly who helped to make this, this day a reality. Matt Dababne, Richard Bloom, Reggie Jones-Sawyer, and Jimmy Gomez, who was exceptionally helpful in the, the waning moments in terms of whipping the final few votes. I especially want to thank Assemblymember Eduardo Garcia for his leadership over the course of the past year and for the partnership that he and Senator Pavley had on this legislation. Having such a strong final product you eased the path towards getting these bills across the finish line. I believe that uh, Assemblymember Garcia and several others are further indications of the rise of what we call East Side environmentalists who will play an increasing role in shaping the state's environmental policies. I also want to thank all the staff who worked on these bills, especially Marie Lou in my office. And of course, and of course to my partners, Senator uh, Pro Tem De Leon and Governor Brown. The cooperation between the Assembly, the Senate, and the Governor made this progress possible, along with a lot more this year. Thank you. It's now my honor to introduce Senator Fran Pavley. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker Rendon. It's been a pleasure working with you. Um, we couldn't have done it without the leadership in both houses of the legislature. So please join me in thanking not only Speaker Rendon, but Senate Pro Tem Kevin De Leon. Now, I don't know how many of you can say this, but I'm a native Angelino. And um, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley in the 50s and 60s. And for any of you who are old, old enough to remember those days, we had red flag alerts. It was very smoggy, health impacts caused by motor vehicles primarily. It's mobile sources that have all been the primary source of our not only greenhouse gas emissions, but criteria air pollution that relates to health impacts. In fact, it was so bad that the California Air Resources Board was formed. I'm looking at Mary Nichols, and she's going to confirm that's correct. In the 60s, they were charged with the fact of coming up with very progressive and aggressive air pollution programs to reduce the health impacts to thousands and then millions of Angelinos. And it's CARB that's done an amazing job and is part of this story here today. So I want to give a shout out to CARB. You know, because of their good work, California predated the Federal Clean Air Act in 1970. We predated that. And so we have a very unique exemption under Federal Clean Air Act law. California, as some of you may know, can pass more stringent air emission standards than the federal government. Now, it takes a little work, and it's uh, providing you can get a waiver from the environmental protection agencies. Other states in the country can adopt California's more stringent emission standards or stick with the federal government standards. And that's another reason why we're here today. Um, Forty waivers have been granted by the EPA over the years. There was even a Supreme Court decision, Massachusetts versus EPA, that um, over 10 years ago made the decision that greenhouse gas emissions are a form of air pollution and subject to the Federal Clean Air Act. That's another reason why we're here today, Supreme Court decision five to four. Um, then back in 2002, um, I was an incoming assembly member and uh, authored a bill called AB 1493, California's Clean Car Law, looking at tailpipe emissions for criteria air pollutants and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it was a challenge getting it passed. We had the signing ceremony not too far away from here, up at Griffith Park. A few of you, I see heads shaking, were there. And um, I remember Governor Gray Davis, who signed the bill, saying, after all this opposition, the sky isn't falling, it's only getting cleaner. And Governor Davis was right. So uh, fast forward, uh, President Obama comes into office. 
Um, our waiver had been denied by the Environmental Protection Agency to implement California's clean car law, mostly for political reasons, um, Bush administration, Dick Cheney, and others. And uh, President Obama announced that California's tailpipe emission standards that had been implemented and passed legal tests multiple, in multiple states, all the work done by the California Air Resources Board, that that would become part of a new national standard linked to the national CAFE standards. I'm not supposed to speak in acronyms around Governor Brown, but it's, his staff is sort of laughing. Corporate Average Fuel Efficiency Standards. That's your miles per gallon standard. And to tell you just an example of how California policies work, do you know by 2025, the average fuel efficiency standard for vehicles across our country will be 54.6 miles per gallon. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> so what California does matters. And um, cleaning up the air, reducing greenhouse gas emission, uh, creating broader choice of vehicles for consumers, for them to save money at the pump, all that has been a fantastic success story. So let's move forward to 2006, and I promise you the short story will get shorter here. Uh, Assembly Bill 32, we're celebrating our 10th anniversary, and several of you out here were instrumental in the passage of that bill. That was a turning point in climate law because businesses started coming to the Capitol to pass these bills. They talked about uh, market signals and the importance of investing in clean technologies. And Governor Schwarzenegger, who signed the bill, um, not too far from here and then again in San Francisco, guaranteed that it wouldn't be a choice between the economy and the environment, that we could do both, and Governor Schwarzenegger was right. Here we are, 10 years later, emissions have gone down, the economy has gone up, it's been a success story, and we've got businesses here today who wouldn't be here without the passage of AB 32. And I should note for the record, this was a joint effort between not only the Assembly and the Senate, um, but my joint author on this bill was Speaker Fabian Nunez, and we started bridging that gap between um, all sorts of uh, culture, positions, looks at jobs, looks at uh, clean air, how it impacts public health. So that was a start uh, down the right road. So, speak. We're going to give recognition to uh, former Speaker Fabian Nunez because we wouldn't be here today without him. And in fact, I think Fabi and I are getting together for a little 10th anniversary party coming up, okay? And I, I called him during this discussion of SB 32 and he was, had a lot of friendly tips on the phone. Um, so fast forward to today, I firstly wanted to shout out and commend uh, Assemblymember Eduardo Garcia, please give him a round of applause. S uh, AB 197 was instrumental. Uh, this bill, SB 32, would not pass without his leadership and Speaker Rendon leadership in the Assembly. The legislature works better when the two houses work together on combined policies, and work on the same page. This was a success story. And what I really like about Eduardo um, as this is my last eight weeks in office, eight to ten weeks in office, it's Eduardo has probably ten more years. So Eduardo, fast forward, picture this, ten years from now, you will be here looking out for extending the targets of SB 32 another ten, fifteen years, uh, maybe to 2050. So he'll be around to help make sure that these policies work right on behalf of all Californians. So thank you, Eduardo. This is, um, this is also a Paris reunion for some of us. Um, I wanted to, again, commend Governor Jerry Brown. For those of you who followed the news in Paris, or those of you who went to Paris, like both of you, and Richard Bloom, Ricardo Lara, and myself, and Eduardo, um, the kid on the block, um, it was an amazing amazing scene. Um, Governor Brown in particular, I don't know how many months he worked prior to Paris in December of last year, but I know in Paris, Governor, you were everywhere. Your energy level, I mean, your staff was exhausted, but you were giving speeches, you were getting 
um, other subnationals to sign a voluntary memorandum of understanding. It was called the MO, uh, MOU under two agreement. His commitment to climate change is real, and we're very fortunate to have Governor Brown in our state as governor at this really important time. So please give it up one more time for Governor Brown. So SB 32, and you notice I just keep the same number. It's easier. Um, re you might remember that in 10 years, Eduardo. So AB 32, SB 32, um, simply puts targets in place. It takes the governor's already existing executive order that he issued of April of this year and puts it in statute. Why does that matter? Why does that matter putting it in statute? I think it matters for two basic reasons. One, you, you can tell everyone and you can ensure the business community and investor community that these policies will stay in place and supported by the legislature for at least to 2030. That's a commitment. And they know when the legislature is on the same page with the administration, they can count on this. Uh, secondly, what's important about this, putting in statute, and I've talked to businesses, especially biofuel companies and other ones, that they say we need those market signals, we need to know those policies will stay in place post-2020, because we're making business decisions right now on whether to hire more people or expand our businesses. That's important. That's the biofuel companies applauding. So. And uh, finally, my last statement, I'm trying to think of something that's not too cliche-like, but uh, I think uh, third time is a charm. Uh, this is my third climate bill with my third governor, and it's been a pleasure and honor to be part of this historic journey, and to Edward Garcia and those who are still in the legislature and will be for the next decade, keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me, let me. Someone who needs no introduction, <laughs> Assemblymember Edward Garcia from the great Coachella Valley. Thank you. So, hold on real quick, Senator. Let, let me just uh, thank the Senator for her work, tireless work uh, for leading not only California, the country, but the world when it comes to climate change. And so how about we give her another round of applause? For her work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Pavley, I think the paper has uh, Acknowledge that I keep calling you Mrs. Pavley, yes. and so we'll formally now transition to Senator Pavley. Thank you for your leadership on this. You may have noticed that I uh, was kind of yanking the governor's um, uh, coat there and trying to see how we may be able to keep him around for the next extension uh, target uh, bill and and maybe have the signing at the Salton Sea, right, Governor Brown? That's right. There you go. Look, <laughs> good luck, he said. <laughs> <laughs> Very promising. <laughs> Very promising. Um, good, good afternoon. It is my uh, great pleasure to be here in uh, uh, Assemblymember Jimmy Gomez's district as well as Senate Pro Tem uh, De Leon's district. It's an honor to be here, although not a, a rock throw away, but certainly a, a little bit of a distance. But one thing in common uh, that we share is the uh, passion that we have to serve uh, the people in our district. And, and one thing that's not been emphasized is that our climate change policies, I think, today and by the signing of these two bills uh, indicate a turning of the page as it relates to focusing on people. Um, uh, the local media and, and of course uh, the, uh, has caught, the, or has, their attention has been caught when I've said uh, uh, continuously that I care about climate change. Uh, I have not ever considered myself a climate change advocate, um, but I know that uh, advocating for Imperial Valley and Coachella Valley is my primary responsibility, a place where a child that is born today is already predetermined to have asthma. Six of ten children uh, have asthma in our community. And so uh, a district that has uh, at sometimes as high as 28 percent unemployment, um, prone to economic challenges, um, that is my priority. Uh, a district that is at the core of much of the water conversations taking place in the state as it relates to management, reallocation of Colorado River, um, that is a priority of ours. And when we look at those issues, uh, we're looking at people and the public health and well-being of their lives. And so that's why I'm engaged in, this, in these conversations. And so for me, it is extremely important that we focus specifically on people, people of color, 
communities that are environmentally uh, set back that have a direct link to the economic challenges, the public health of children, and of course, you know, the concerns that we all have as it relates to water in the state. I want to just highlight how important uh, the work that we have now moving forward is, not only to my colleagues in the Assembly, but in the Senate, um, but to the people of California. Uh, I'm of a thought that every uh, and any large investment that California makes needs to have a critical uh, and analytical perspective when it comes to our communities that are economically disadvantaged. That any and every policy that we push forward and investment uh, prioritizes our communities that happen to be communities of color. And in order for California to succeed, we have to address the disparities that exist in these parts of California. And that's the California and the district that I represent. And so for me, that is why we're involved uh, on these issues. It is great to be part of this uh, changing uh, dynamic when it comes to our climate change policies. But more important, uh, it will be what we do and how we change the circumstances of people's lives and these economically uh, distressed communities that will ultimately be the judge of the work that we're doing today. And so I am very proud to be here before you, certainly under the leadership of uh, Speaker Rendon. I know that we will continue moving in this direction. There's no question that with Senate Pro Tem de Leon, uh, we will continue the collaboration uh, with both houses and that the signing of these bills today demonstrate the will and desire by the legislative branch to be a co-equal uh, representative in our state government. And so thank you again. Uh, this gentleman who I get to introduce needs no real formal introduction. He is a world champion on climate change. And I think today by the signing of these bills, he's saying that he cares about poor people in economically disadvantaged communities. And so with that, let me introduce Governor Jerry Brown. So, as you've heard, this is really an important bill, an important day, and I can't emphasize enough how important this uh, work of the California legislature, both houses, mostly, almost entirely, the Democratic Party has done this, uh, and it's not easy. Uh, what we're doing here is not one of these obvious bills. There's powerful opposition, and that opposition uh, has shown itself against clean air since the Clean Air Act began. And whether it's car companies or oil companies or electric utilities or gas companies, at one time or another, they all fight. And they're real people with real bucks and real influence. And so the bills today, they really are far-reaching. And they keep California on the move to uh, clean up the environment, to encourage vast innovation, and to make sure we have the environmental resilience that the Californians uh, really want and expect. And I want to say something about low-income people. Uh, people of, of uh, modest means who live in the Central Valley, who live in Riverside, San Bernardino, Imperial County, they're the ones that uh, eat the dirtiest air. And we're not going to clean up that air until we reduce pollutants in the way this bill uh, is, is uh, uh, purporting to do and will do. And we have to continue doing that. So when you talk about the air, Everybody's breathing the air, and young children, many of whom are getting asthma, older people with respiratory disease, they're the victims. And if we don't stop climate change, it's not going to be 110 in Imperial County, it's going to be 130, 135. Not for a few days or a few weeks, but for months on end. It can become unlivable. Now, it's not going to happen perhaps during your term, but we're setting in motion either efforts to stop that, or to do nothing and let it happen. And the great problem with these big issues is that when you wait too long because you can't see it, it's too late to do anything about it. So what we're doing here is far-sighted as well as far-reaching. And it takes a lot of courage and a lot of vision. California is doing something that no other state has done. You're putting into law real measures backed up by the real power of the state of California. This is big and I hope it sends a message across the country and those Republicans in Congress, if God help us if they win again, but if they do, may they be converted. May they see the light before it's too late. And that's what this is also about. All right? And by the way, I don't want to be partisan, 
But these guys deny science, say our drought is, is not true, yeah. they say there aren't forest fires, that floods are not occurring in Florida and New Orleans. That's not true. Anybody who lies like that should not be listened to. That's all. And this legislature <laughs> is moving forward. I'm glad that I can do my modest part by signing the bill. Not veto. I still can veto it, but I won't. <laughs> Don't worry, I won't. Because this is law. And by the way, since we're telling all these old stories, Tom Quinn's not here, but her predecessor, media predecessor, first time around, um, started to lower the emissions uh, of NOx, uh, nitrogen and oxygen, which caused a lot of uh, smog and poison and all the rest of it. Henry Ford II came out himself. So we dealt with the biggies. So when you hear these guys knocking on your door, you know that we've taken down the biggest of the big. And so whoever they are, they're all going to fall before the truth of this, uh, what shall I call this? Christian army marching on, or not Christian, can't say that. Oh, with, with Jewish warriors standing behind. No, what I was trying to think is onward soldiers, and I only know one saw. But whatever it's going to take, it's going to take battle, it's going to take wisdom, and it will take some balance that we don't overdo it. But I'm not afraid that we're going to get to that point.